right, we're going to jump right in because there's a lot in this chapter, and I'm going to try to preach. There's, there's one topic in particular I'm going to start off with, and I, it's just, it's important to cover this from time to time. Um, it's, a, it's a doctrine that's been attacked recently, it seems like, but any, look at verse number one, and we're going to get right into it. So, uh, verse number one reads, and it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And I'm going to be preaching about how Old Testament saints went to heaven when they died. And there's a lot of doctrines that get twisted up into this. And, and one of the big doctrines that, um, that's resulting of this, or, or this is kind of a side point on, is that people today are losing the concept of Jesus Christ's soul going to hell when he died for those three days and three nights before he rose again from the dead. And this is a great story that illustrates, you know, we have a perfect example of someone here with Elijah being carried up literally into heaven by a whirlwind, by the, the chariots of heaven, these flaming chariots and the horses carrying him up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elijah literally going to heaven. And I've had this, this you know, trying to show people who disagree and say, oh, no, no. Because what they'll try to tell you is that when people died in the Old Testament, all the way up until Jesus rose again from the dead, they went to this place called paradise or Abraham's bosom that's in the center of the earth. And it's this place called hell, but it's not really hell. It's this other side of hell and all this nonsense. And when you bring up to say, no, what about Elijah? Elijah went to heaven. Oh, that was an exception. What? Why, why? Like, first of all, where do you say it's an exception? We have clear evidence from Scripture right here of an Old Testament saint going to heaven. And I've had, I've had another person try to say, oh, well, went to heaven, it just means he went up into the sky. Oh, uh, yeah, but then he's not found anymore. Like, hello. Well, why would he just go into the sky? Do you think he's just flying around like Santa Claus on a sleigh or something? Like just over the earth, just flying in the clouds? No, of course not. And as we see from the story, they end up sending, looking for him because they're like, oh, well, maybe God put him down somewhere. And he didn't. Elisha knew that God, he wasn't just going to be replaced somewhere. No, he was being taken from his head that day and God was taking him up to heaven just like he did with Enoch. Right. And that's another example we have in the Old Testament. If you want to hold your place here, flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 5. Now that verse 1, it just said that it's stating when, you know, God was going to take up Elijah into heaven by whirlwind. And then in verse number 11, it comes to pass. If I'll just read that for you, verse 11 says, And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. It happened. He went to heaven. Verse uh, 22 of Genesis 5. The Bible says, And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah, 300 years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now we get a little bit more information in Hebrews 11, if you want to turn to Hebrews 11. Because we don't get very much info on, in Genesis chapter 5 other than just, well, Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When God takes him, he's not just taking him and throwing him into the center of the earth to hang out for a while until the resurrection of Jesus. God took him to be with him. We get, we get that more clearly in Hebrews 11, verse number 5. The Bible says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death Amen. and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He was, I mean, he's literally a picture of the resurrection because he actually got his body translated into, you know, into going to heaven, which is something that, you know, we're going to have our, our soul or our spirit will be in heaven when we die. If we die before Jesus Christ comes back, we're not going to have our, we're not going to be translated though. Jesus Christ was transfigured before, um, of Peter and James and John in, in, uh, in the Mount of Olives. But, um, you know, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and he was not found because God translated him. 
He went to be with God. We have two examples. It's kind of like, how many more examples do you need in the Old Testament of saints like literally going to heaven before you're going to say, well, maybe they did go to heaven? And why would you say, like, like what, is, what would be the, the purpose of an exception? If Jesus, I mean, Jesus Christ paid for the sins of the whole world. Was Elijah saved by the blood of Jesus Christ? You better believe he was. So why wouldn't he have to wait with everyone else supposedly, before the resurrection of Christ to actually make the payment and for that payment to be paid in full before he could go into heaven and God just brought him up to heaven by a whirlwind. What's he going to be doing up there all by himself anyway? <laughs> right? I mean, he's going to be serving God, but like, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, the Bible says, you know, this whole concept, this, this concept that uh, Jesus Christ had to rise again from the dead before anybody could make it into heaven. It's like the Bible says he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was part of God's plan. Did Jesus have to do all those things? Yes, he did. Did Jesus have a free will? Yes, he did. But was there any, ever any doubt that he was going to complete what he was going to complete? No. And doesn't God, isn't God outside of time anyways? And, and he's the one who created time and knows that's why he's the one, the, slam, the, lamb, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's, it's nonsense to think that like, oh, well, there's this holding cell that every, all these souls are going to until Jesus Christ is resurrected. Then all these souls are going to go up to heaven when we have no record of that in the Bible. I mean, think about how big of an event that is. It would have been, if there's all of these souls just waiting to go to heaven at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I mean, that's a lot of people. For something like that to have happened, and zero mention of that in the Bible. Right. No mention of, well, all of these souls just appeared in heaven. At the rapture, we have in Revelation, John seeing, wow, where did all these people come from? Whoa, whoa where, did, where did this great multitude come from? That event's recorded because it is. there is going to be a lot of people all of a sudden showing up at heaven at one time. But there are people from this earth that were alive. They get caught up and, and, and gathered together and you know, people who are martyred in this mass uh, martyrdom being done. Those events are big events and they're recorded. But supposedly this event of Jesus Christ raising, being resurrected from the dead and then all these souls is going into heaven because... Now the punishment's been paid. Doesn't make any sense. And that's and it's not found anywhere in Scripture. Uh, turn if you go to Job, Job chapter 1. We have another example of saints in heaven. Old Testament saints being in heaven. See, what, what happens is you have this, this misunderstanding at best of certain passages in Scripture, and then people trying to reconcile that and getting into twisting all kinds of different doctrines then. Because every, every doctrine is tied to something else. Everything that you believe in the Bible gets, it, it, you have to, it's going to impact, when you start screwing with one area and start twisting it and messing with it and you get something wrong, it's going to impact other areas. You're going to find that you're, like, it's, it's with the pre-trib rapture, you know, we were just talking about this before service. The pre-trib rapture, cannot stand on its own, typically you're going to need some form of Zionism, some form of pre, uh, uh, dispensationalism, and, and some form of, um, what's the third thing? There's three things. Zionism, dispensationalism, and uh, oh, this is totally slipping my head right now. Anyhow, it, 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 it's doesn't matter. It affects other doctrine, right? It's gonna, you're going you're gonna to be screwed up in, in various areas. And it's going to come to me that way later on when I'm preaching a sermon. I'll we'll bring it up. But uh, what we have here is the same exact thing going on. Job chapter 1, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. So here we see the sons of God came to present themselves. Before the Lord, up in heaven. Verse 12, it says, but it, or excuse me, how do we know that these are Old Testament saints? 
Because in John 1, 12, the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. See, there's people out there that, that believe, that don't want to believe that Old Testament saints went to heaven, so they got to do something with this verse. And they say, well, when it says sons of God, that's not talking about believers. It's talking about angels. So now they're starting to say that angels are actually sons of God, and any of God's creation is a son of God, because, I mean, when you start making that approach, well, the reason why they're sons of God is because God created the angels. So you're going to tell me that a cow is a son of God. I mean, God created cows, didn't he? When we have clear scripture in Hebrews 1, verse 5 says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. You know what that says? God has never called any of his angels his son. Because they're not sons of God. They're ministering spirits sent to minister unto us. That's what the angels are. But because you can't have believers in heaven in the Old Testament, you have to do something with this verse. So they get into all these various weird doctrines and it starts corrupting the, you know, what the Bible is actually saying. So in order to believe that Jesus Christ or that, uh, yeah, that Jesus Christ didn't actually go to hell as we understand hell, you have to believe that the sons of God in the Old Testament are angels. You have to believe that um, there's two compartments in hell. You have to believe that nobody went to heaven until the resurrection of Christ, which is not found anywhere in Scripture. They just come up with that because all of a sudden later you see all these references to saints in heaven. So it's like, well, we know they're there later. We know that the Apostle Paul said that um, you know, he'd rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. And we know what Jesus Christ said unto the thief at the cross, which they have a problem with that as well, about being in paradise. Now, turn if you would to 1 Samuel 28, because I'm just going to show you one of the few, or some of the only evidence provided that Old Testament saints went down into the earth instead of up to heaven. So if someone brings this up to you, I want you to be able to, to look at this. You may have never even heard this before. But I've, I've, I've talked, you know, like I said before, you know, I say this all the time, I'm ready to be challenged on what I believe. I've, I've been challenged on what I believe many times, and that's fine. And I, and I like getting challenges because if I haven't heard it before, I want to see what, what, you know, what are, you, what are you coming up with? What are people saying out there? What are people believing? And if I'm wrong, I'd like to change about it, but I, I, know, I know for a fact I'm not wrong on this doctrine at all. Right. But this is some of the best evidence that I've seen in 1 Samuel 28. Verse number 11. This is when Saul, King Saul, went to the witch to talk to Samuel because God wasn't talking to him anymore. God was done with him. And, and Samuel's already dead and he, and he wants to, to call up Samuel. So in verse number 11, in 1 Samuel 28, the Bible reads, Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. So first they just use this, Oh, he's saying he's going to bring him up. Well, where is he bringing him up from? I mean, there's a direction. It says up, so he's bringing him up from the earth, because that's where his soul is coming from, which is ridiculous. Obviously, this is a phrase that people are using to conjure up right. devils or demons or people or spirits or whatever. I mean, you're, you're conjuring up. It's, 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 a, it's a phrase that is used. It doesn't necessarily imply an actual direction of his soul being in hell and coming up right. from the center of the earth. If anything, it has to do with calling people up from the grave, right? Because you bury someone in the grave, so you're calling them back up. But it doesn't mean that they're, I mean, this is, and this is witchcraft. Right. This isn't, this isn't, you know, this isn't the Bible. I mean, it's, it, the story's in the Bible, but the, the practice of conjuring up people is not a biblical practice. So the phrase being used is not something that's just inherent truth. It's something that they use in witchcraft. So he says, you know, whom shall I bring up? And he said, bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, be not afraid for what sawest thou. And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Okay, so this is the witch's testimony. Now, did she see gods? No. She didn't know what she saw. But she just saw this, this vision. Now, 
For one, this shows you she saw something she's never seen before. This is a witch. This is someone who's used to calling up people, but now it's like she actually saw something real. So whether she was a charlatan or not, I don't know, but she definitely saw something different than what she's used to seeing when she's communicating with demons or devils or whatever she does. And, you know, obviously a lot of these uh, um, the people who are into witchcraft and magic, a lot of them, it's just a fraud. You know, the, the, the tarot card readers and the palm readers and, you know, people who want to do all this stuff. A lot of it, a lot of it is just fraud because there's so many people just want to believe whatever that it's an, they're an easy mark to just get money from and they could tell them whatever you want and they know how to play people and con people. But some of it's real. Sure. Some of it is people with familiar spirits. Some of it is, you know, the Bible talks about that. The necromancy and the, and the wicked things, the witchcraft that God says we aren't supposed to be doing at all and actually, you know, the wizards and the witches, they should be put to death according to God in the Bible. That was God's judgment on it. I mean, that's how serious it is about us getting involved with those things that we don't understand in the spirit world. We have nothing to do with it. But she actually sees something here because she does actually speak to Samuel. Saul actually speaks to Samuel. Verse number 14, And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. And Samuel said to Saul. So like in verse 15, that's the narrator of the Bible saying, and Samuel said to Saul. That's not the witch saying it. That's not Saul saying it. This is, this is God. This is the Holy Ghost saying, Samuel said to Saul. So we know it was Samuel. So we know that's real, right? But it says, he says, why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And again, this phrase being used, bring me up, bring me up, you brought up, it's the language being used for a witch or a wizard to bring up someone, you know, to talk to someone from beyond the grave. It's not, the, it, you know, this has nothing to do, and any just standard reading of it is going to tell you that. You have to really be trying to read into this story to say, oh, this is talking about direction. He's being brought up because he's in the center of the earth. When it doesn't say that anywhere, it says, And Saul answered, I am sore distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God is apart from me, and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. And the reason why people try to prove this, this, this weird thing about saints not going to heaven, the Old Testament saints, the Old Testament believers, is because they're screwed up or confused about some other scripture. And they're desperately trying to prove a doctrine that simply is not found in Scripture. So what they do is they try to, to fit that, that square peg in a round hole, right? It just doesn't work. But they're trying to do it, and they're trying to cut off the corners of the square peg to get it to fit in that circle. And one of the ways they do that is, like, aha, see, in 1 Samuel 28, we got Samuel being called up. He must have been down if he's being called up and use that type of logic, and it's nonsense. And then I'm telling you, this is like, this is some of the best evidence that I've ever heard anyone use to try to justify their doctrine. Because then they go off on all this weird stuff, like I said, with the sons of God being angels. <coughs> and they have no excuse for Elijah being caught up in, by a whirlwind into heaven other than just, well, that's an exception. It's just like the people who believe, well, you need to be baptized in order to be saved. Well, what about the thief on the cross? Well, that was an exception. God's not the God of exceptions. God is a holy God. God is a just God. God is a, a lawgiver. And he says, thus saith the Lord, and this is the way it is. There are no exceptions with God. There's no gray areas. There's black and white. There's truth and there's lies. And it's just the way it is. He is he's not a respecter of persons. God was not a respecter of Elijah to say, well, Elijah, I know you're a sinner, and I know you need a Savior too, but I'm just going to bring you into heaven when everyone else is going to have to wait because I love you more than them and I'm just going to just you're going to have this special time with me and you don't have to wait for Jesus Christ to rise again from the dead before I take you into heaven. That doesn't make any sense. God's not a respecter of persons in that in that in that manner. So one of the verses that people have a problem with and they can't understand is Luke 23:43 where Jesus said unto the thief on the cross, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And the reason why they have a problem with that verse is because we know Jesus died on the cross that day, so he's telling him, hey, basically what he's telling him is you're saved. 
Because if the thief looked on him and said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he said, okay, you know, very last thing to do, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. But the Bible is very clear, very clear, the Bible says that Jesus Christ's soul went to hell for three days and three nights. The Bible says his soul descended into hell. I mean, he, he, he went to hell. So you cannot refute that. So the problem that people have is they say, well, wait a minute. We know that Jesus Christ going, you know, was going to die and go to hell. So how can he say that today he's going to be in paradise if he has to go to hell? And that's what gets people confused. Now turn, if you would, to John chapter 3. So the conclusion that they come up with is that, well, paradise must be in the heart of the earth. And they just come up with new definitions of hell. And they'll say, well, when the Bible says hell, it's just referring to this region in the center of the earth. The whole region refers to hell. Where part of hell or this region is fire and brimstone and there's people being tormented and, tor and tortured. But another part of it is people who are just believers waiting for the resurrection of Christ to go to heaven. And, they, and they, they just start, you know, that is found nowhere in Scripture. They have to just come up with this stuff to try to make things fit that they don't understand, that don't need to fit that way, but they just don't get this. Now, that word paradise is only found three times in the Bible. Right. Three times, three mentions. They're all in the New Testament. There's this one that he says, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. In 2 Corinthians 12, 4, the Bible says how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter, clearly talking about being in heaven. And then in Revelation 2, 7, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The tree of life, again, and you could prove that the tree of life, and everything, you know, this is found in heaven before God's throne. So we have two references out of three clearly talking about being in heaven, but they're still going to say, no, paradise was relocated to heaven from the center of the earth, from the heart of the earth. It makes no sense. And the reason why is because they don't understand. It's, it's so easy. We have scriptural examples of how this can work. How can Jesus say to the thief on the cross that today you're going to be with me in paradise? It's because Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. You're in John chapter 3. Look at verse number 12. This is the simple explanation. Now, I know a lot of people have a hard time understanding. And do I understand this 100% with all clarity of mind exactly how this happens? No, but it's what, it's what the Bible has already said, what Jesus Christ has already said. Remember, when we're reading the Bible and we're reading the words of Jesus Christ, these are the words that he spake while he was on this earth. Like literally his body was here and he was speaking. So while he's speaking in John chapter 3, verse number 12, the Bible says, Jesus Christ said, If I have told you earthly things and you believe me not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? Jesus, which is in heaven. As he's on this earth, he says, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So while Jesus was on this earth, he was also in heaven. So when he says to the, the thief on the cross, today shalt thou be with me in paradise, how could he say that? Because he's God. Because he's able to be in heaven at the same time that he's on this earth and while he's also paying for our sins in hell. Now, is that an easy concept to grasp? Not really. But we have the biblical example already of Jesus Christ himself saying this. So when you look at this passage and you say, oh, well, we know from the other references of paradise that it's talking about a good place, it's talking about heaven, it's talking about up, it's with God and heaven. You don't have to redefine the word or the location of it just because of what he said here, because he's God. It's, it's a very simple explanation. Now, the truth of the matter is that Jesus' soul went to hell. I'm going to read for you all of the references to hell in the Scripture. It's a little bit exhaustive, but I feel like I want to do this because people get away with 
The false doctrine, the nonsense of saying that, oh, when Jesus went to hell, he wasn't really suffering. Oh, he wasn't really, do you know, it was the good part of hell. It was the, the not so hot part of hell. It's like this purgatory, in a sense. It's, it's right next door to hell. It's nonsense. So we're going to go through tonight. It's a little bit exhaustive, but I'm going to try to go really quickly. Pay attention to the references to hell and tell me if any of them sound even remotely close to being positive or a good place or a place that you would ever think that you would want to be at all. So I'm going to blow through these. I'll give you the references. You can write them down if you want, or you can just do the word search on your own. They're all in order. Deuteronomy 32, 22. I'm not leaving anything out. This is every reference to the word hell. Deuteronomy 32, 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell and shall consume the earth with her increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. Not a good reference. <laughs> We're going to get a lot. Don't worry, I'm not going to stop for every single verse. We're, we're going to keep going, but what we just read there, you're going to see a lot more of that. 2 Samuel 22, 6. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Sound like a good place? Sorrows of hell? No. Job 11, 8. If it is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Okay, there's one that's neutral. Deeper than hell. But is that positive? Does it say anything about saints being there? No. Job 26, 6. Hell is naked before him and destruction hath no covering. It's equating hell with destruction. Psalm 9, 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell in the nations that forget God. Psalm 16, 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. This is what's quoted in Acts chapter 2 about the quote of Jesus Christ's soul going to hell. And contrasting that with his body seeing corruption. But hell's a good place that God's not going to leave his soul in. Why is he worried about God leaving his soul there if it's such a good place? Psalm 18, 5, the sorrows of hell, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. Psalm 55, 15, let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. Psalm 86, 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. Psalm 116, 3. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the pains of hell get hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Psalm 139, 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Psalm, or excuse me, Proverbs 5, 5. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Talking about the adulterous woman. So Proverbs 7, 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Proverbs 9, 18. But he knoweth not that the dead are there and that her guests are in the depths of hell. These are all references to that adulterous woman. Proverbs 15, 11. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men. Proverbs 15, 24, the way of life. Listen, this, Old Testament, Proverbs 15, 24, the way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. The way of life is above. There's another reference talking about heaven being the way of life. If you have eternal life, if you've believed on the Lord, you're going to heaven when you die because that's the way of life. Even in the Old Testament, Proverbs 23, 14, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shalt deliver his soul from hell. Oh, but I thought hell's a good place. Why are you delivering his soul from there? Proverbs 27, 20, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Isaiah 5, 14, therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Isaiah 14, 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. Isaiah 14, 15, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Isaiah 28, 15, because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death. And with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come upon to us. 
For we have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Isaiah 28, 18. And your covenant with death shall be disannulled, and your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Then you shall be trodden down by it. Isaiah 57, 9. And thou wentest to the king with ointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and didst debase thyself even unto hell. Ezekiel 31, 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. When I cast him down to hell, with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden, the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. You know, turn to Ezekiel 31, because this is one other place I've actually tried, I've heard someone try to use this as, oh, see, here's a good place in hell. And, and this, it's kind of silly. It, 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 it shouldn't even have to mention it. When you read the context of Ezekiel, chapter number 31, this is not talking about anybody good. This is not a good reference to hell. I wasn't going to stop here, but I want to. So the beginning of, verse of, of chapter 31, in verse 2, it says, Son of man, speak unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his multitude, whom art thou like in thy greatness? And if you know the book of Ezekiel, there's a lot of rebuke going on to a lot of different areas, a lot of different nations, a lot of different wicked kings and wicked people. So here's a rebuke against Egypt. Do you think Egypt, Pharaoh of Egypt, is, is a godly man? No, of course not. Um, and, it, and it refers to these people, these great men of the earth, these great kings, as being trees, right? These trees that are high and mighty being cut down and cast into hell. I mean, that's the imagery being given here. So in verse 15, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, In the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. I covered the deep for him, and I restrained the floods thereof, and the great waters were stayed. And I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. When I cast him down to hell, with them that descend into the pit, and all the trees of Eden... The choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. So they're saying, oh, see the trees of Eden, those are good trees, right? Good trees of Eden, of course they're going to be good. And that they're, they're comforted in Lebanon, or in, excuse me, in hell, in the nether parts of the earth. The comfort that's being received here <coughs> is... First of all, these trees of Eden, it's not referring to the literal trees of Eden. It's not like there's trees in the heart of the earth. It's imagery talking about these great and mighty kings that are like the trees of Eden, right? They've, they've got this great beauty and they, and they have amassed themselves all this glory as a tree of Eden. It's, it's, it's comparing them to a tree of Eden. And it says that uh, they shall be comforted in other parts of the earth. Why are they be comforted? When they see the other wicked kings being brought down to hell also. That they're not there alone. I mean, is it some great comfort? I mean, yeah, they're going to be in torture and pain and stuff, but it's like this little bit of comfort saying, aha, you're here too. Because misery loves company. That's the comfort being talked about. It's not like, oh, this is some great place and that, oh, the king of Egypt was cut down and cast into hell, but it was a good place. I mean, get the context of this. Just because you see a reference to oh, water, all that drink water, yeah, and Eden, yeah, see, so look, Eden and water and everything, this is all in the heart of the earth. It's nonsense. Yeah. Read the whole passage. Read the whole chapter. Read chapter 31. Read chapter 32. You're going to see it's not a positive reference at all. Being cut down and cast into hell with them that go down to the pit. I'm going to keep going through these. Ezekiel, so... Verse number um, 17, they also went down into hell with him unto them that be slain with the sword and they that were his arm and dwelt under a shadow in the midst of the heathen. Chapter 32 of Ezekiel, verse 21, the strong among the mighty shall speak to him out of the midst of hell with them that help him. They are gone down. They lie uncircumcised slain by the sword. Again, the uncircumcision referring to people who are not saved, not believers in, that, in this reference here. Ezekiel 32, 27. And they shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised, which are gone down to hell with the weapons of war. 
and they have laid their swords under their heads, but their iniquities shall be upon their bones, though they were the terror of the mighty in the land of the living. Amos 9, 2, though they dig into hell, then shall mine hand take them, though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Jonah 2, 2, and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Now, I know I preach on this topic before, and I've, I've done it looking at the entire chapter 2 of Jonah and comparing that with Jesus Christ, because Jonah, being a prophet, was not, didn't literally go down into hell. When he says, out of the belly of hell cried I, he was prophesying the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ went down into hell. And Jesus references Jonah on purpose in Matthew 12, 40. He says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus Christ himself said Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. But Jonah himself said, out of the belly of hell cried I. Why? Because he was prophesying he wasn't speaking of himself. He was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ going to hell. And read the whole, all of Jonah too, and you, get, and you see him going back and forth between him describing being in the belly and being in hell. The earth with her bars were about me forever. In Jonah 2. Look, there's ample evidence in the Bible to support what I'm saying about Jesus Christ's soul literally going to hell. We don't need to, to do mental acrobats to try to disprove this. It, you know, people just need to learn to accept. When you, when you see something very clear in the Bible, just accept it. I don't care if it goes against whatever your pet thing is with the, with the angels being sons of God or whatever it is that you choose that you think you want to believe. Just accept what the Bible says for what it says. You don't have to cram paradise into hell. Just accept it. Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. What's so hard to believe about that? It actually should make you love him even more for facing that fate and actually paying the debt that we, all, we deserve to pay on our own anyways. And people want to say, oh, he didn't go to hell because he said it is finished on the cross. Well, wait a minute. If he didn't have to do anything else, then what about the resurrection? Is that an important part? If everything was done... Him shedding his blood and dying, is that all that was necessary? No. Because his soul went to hell, and he also had to be raised again from the dead. And again, it's a misunderstanding of what he said. What does it is finished mean? What does it mean? Well, if you say everything that was required for our salvation, then you're wrong. And if you say, well, that's a, that's a reason why he couldn't have gone to hell. Well, the Bible says he went to hell. And we're reading every single reference to the word hell. And I'm sorry, my friend, I don't see a positive reference. Every reference I see is people being tortured and tormented and sorrow and, and grief and pain of hell. It's not a pleasant place. You have, the only way you could get any other concept is just by not believing the word of God and coming up with something on your own or listening to some stinking professor somewhere that's just been studying the Bible all day and studying, not even the Bible, because if they're studying the Bible, they'd probably know a little bit more. They're studying all these other books and all, reading all these other doctrines of man and other people <coughs> and not going out and preaching the gospel and not doing what's right and just coming up with all these new fangled beliefs because they want to make a name for themselves or whatever. And then you got other people just buying into all this, reading a bunch of garbage instead of staying in the word of God. I'm not saying never read another book written by another human being. Obviously, we can do that. But we ought to have the majority of our, of our doctrine coming from God's Word and spending our time reading His Word. That's what's going to keep your mind straight on doctrine. Habakkuk 2.5, Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Matthew 5, 22. But I say unto you that whosoever, and these are for a long time, and I was going to be Jesus Christ speaking. Not that he's, it's any more important than the rest of the word of God, but talking about, I mean, Jesus Christ is the one that said that he was going to be in hell for three days and three nights. If he wasn't referring to the, the bad place of hell, you would think at least one time he would make a reference to this place that really isn't that bad. 
Matthew 5, 22, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Rekha, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Matthew 5, 29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It's better for you to cut off your hand than to go to hell. It's what Jesus Christ said. It's better for you to pluck out an eyeball than it is to go to hell. Doesn't sound like a good place that I want to go to. Matthew 10, 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew eleven twenty three, 23. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Matthew 16, 18, And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Matthew 18, 9, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from me. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. Matthew 23, 15, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you can pass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Matthew 23, 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Hell is damnation. Hell is not a good place. It's not a place for believers. It is damnation. Hello, how much does it take? Do we have to read this over and over and over again? It's like you don't read the Bible if you think hell is ever referring to a good place. Mark 9, 43, and if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, and the fire that never shall be quenched. Mark 9, 47, if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Luke 10, 15, and thou Capernaum, which art exalted to heaven, shalt be thrust down to hell. Luke 12, 5, But I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Luke 16, 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And this is where you get the, oh, well, it's Abraham's bosom. Jesus Christ said his soul went to hell. A bosom is a body part. This is my bosom. And if I embrace somebody, they're in my bosom. Abraham was em embracing Lazarus. Why? Because he lived a hard life on this earth. Because his body was full of sores and the dogs were licking him. He's begging for crumbs at a rich man's table. So when he died and went to heaven, Abraham received him and embraced him and comforted him because now he's in heaven. Now he doesn't have to worry about that pain anymore. But that's too difficult for some people to understand. And you get so wrapped up into coming up with these weird fables and doctrines that, that don't even make any sense. And you, and you try to match it up against Scripture and you come up lacking because there's nothing to support it. It's an imagination. Acts 2.27, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And of course, Peter goes on here in verse 31. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh should see corruption. What are we missing here? Speaking of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection, when Jesus Christ came up from the dead, where did he come up from? Hell. Why? Because his soul wasn't left in hell? And what is hell? Well, we've just read almost every single reference so far. I'm going to read the last few right now. We'll be done with this, with this portion. James 3, 6, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. It goes on and on. Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. 
Revelation 6, 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. Revelation 20, 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. The dead, not the living, not those of everlasting life, the dead that were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And in the last place, verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Hell is going to be relocated. Hell's going to be relocated to the place called the lake of fire. That's the second death that, that the Bible's referring to here. I never see a mention of paradise being relocated. I never see a mention of a place called Abraham's bosom other than in a story where Abraham was embracing a man. But no, people want to come up with an entire doctrine because they don't know how to explain like one verse or two verses. And had they read enough of their Bible, it's easy to explain. It's easy to see where it matches up and lines up perfectly with other scripture. Oh, this day shall thou be with me in paradise? Well, Jesus also said that I'm in heaven while I'm on this earth. Okay, next. I mean, what's so hard to understand about that? You don't have to start messing around with all this other doctrine just to come up with this stuff. Let's get back to 2 Kings. Hey, we're, we did verse number one. Right. We're getting somewhere now. I'm getting off of the subject, but that was every single... I think it's important to do this every once in a while. Normally, I would just say, you know what, do the study on your own, but most people don't go out and do the study on their own. So I did it for you. And that is every single mention of the word hell in the Bible. And we saw the reference of Jesus Christ being in hell. Did anyone at any time hear a positive reference of hell at all? Anything that was like, that's not so bad. No, the word is used very consistently. And to try to make up something else is, is really despicable. You're either ignorant and you need to read the Bible more or you've been deceived by someone and you're not reading the Bible enough. People need to get their, their, their you know, and, and there's people that I've listened to before that I like some of the things that they teach, but they, get, they got caught up in this doctrine and I don't even understand how. I don't even understand how. And I think the, the only thing I can come up with is that they're reading too many books written by men and not enough Bible. The, the, the amount of reading that they're doing is not, is not balanced enough. See, what we should have is, my opinion, if we have a level of how much reading we do, a scale of, well, this is how much Bible reading we should be doing, which is a lot. I mean, I know if I'm doing like the scale, it should be heavy, right? So like we should be heavy on the doctor. However you want to look at it, if we're doing quantity going up of how much reading, well, we should have that quantity really high compared to how much other reading we do. And this doesn't have to be at zero. But this needs to be guiding us in making sure that anything we're reading over here is lining up with this book. And the only way we could do this is by knowing what's in here. And no one should be able to trick you into another definition of hell or paradise. That is insane to me. How many times hell is referenced? And, but, but someone's going to tell you, well, Jesus Christ didn't actually suffer in hell. Really? But everyone else does? And he went to pay for our sins? Second Kings chapter 2. Don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through. There's, there's some other things. I'm probably going to end up making entire sermons out of some of the other subjects here because there is so much in this chapter. Second Kings chapter 2. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. I won't spend too much time on this because I recovered this another sermon recently, but we see here the faithfulness of Elisha and his willingness to stay with and support Elijah until the end. Too many people fall out and do not endure unto the end and are, are too willing to... When something bad's going to happen is get away. You know, I mean, when Jesus Christ got arrested, all his disciples fled from him, right? Elisha's being warned that, hey, 
don't you, and, and not right here, but in a little bit, you know, here he's just, you know, Elijah's just telling him, hey, just wait here, you know, I'm just going to go off on my own, don't worry about me. Elijah's like, no, I'm coming with you, man, I'm with you. I'm going to support you, I'm here for you, I'm serving you, and Elijah was Elijah's servant all the way up until Elijah was taken. Amen. He was his servant. And he was there to serve him all the way up until he took the mantle and carried it forward. Elijah, or excuse me, Elisha, look at this, he's blessed because he stuck with Elijah. Had he stayed back in Gilgal, he wouldn't have received the double portion of that spirit that Elijah had on himself. He would have just been like one of the other sons of the prophets at that point. Look at verse number 9. It says, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, because at this point now Elijah had already told him, Okay, stay, wait here. They go, Okay, now wait here. And he's like, No, no, I'm going with you. And then you got the sons of the prophets saying, hey, don't you know that your master's going to be taken from you today? Don't you know that you're going to lose Elijah? Don't you know, what do you do and follow him? Well, don't, don't you know that? And he's like, yeah, I know. Shut up. Like, I'm still with him. And in verse 9, it says, it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elijah, ask what I shall do for thee. So at this point, he's, he's thankful. Like he's, he's made it all the way with him. Well, what should I do for you before I be taken away from thee? And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. Now, there's so much, even just in these, in these two statements, these two verses. Elisha's asking for a great thing here. A double portion of thy spirit. Hey, if you want to do a big work for God, you have to be thinking big and not limit what God is capable of. Elijah's a great man of God. And we know, I mean, God caught him up into heaven by a whirlwind in a chariot. Sounds like a pretty great man to me. He stood and did all kinds of great, wondrous things. But Elisha wasn't intimidated by that. He didn't say, oh, I could never do what Elijah did and have this attitude of inferiority to Elijah, who was a, a, a man with like passions as we, he looked at this and said, wow, look at everything Elijah did. I want to do twice as much. And that's the attitude that we ought to have. Don't be intimidated by people doing a lot for God. Don't let that discourage you. In fact, encourage you and say, hey, if he can do that, I know that I can do it because he's a person too. And you know, pray to God, God, use me to do twice as much. If he's doing that much, help me to do even more. I want to do as much for you as possible, Lord. Use me. Help me. And Elijah knew, hey, I did a lot of things for God. You know, that's a, that, you're asking for a lot. God did a lot of things through me. He knew that. And he did. But look at, look at the attitude Elijah had. Did Elijah have, oh, ho, ho, no, no, son. Who, do you know who you're talking to? I, I have my master of divinity. Well, you think, you think you can do what I've done? That's not the attitude Elijah had. He said, well, we've asked a hard thing, but hey, if you see me where I'm going, it's, your, it's yours, buddy. Set the world on fire for the Lord. Amen. So don't ever, you know, and, and wherever you're at spiritually, don't look down on people and think, ha, 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 and scoff at them when they're zealous and they want to do, hey, maybe I can do some great, you know, yeah, maybe you can. Let's encourage them and help them to do even more. Absolutely, that yeah, should go without saying, right? But unfortunately, you get too many people get puffed up in themselves and get too proud in their own knowledge and everything else and just, and just want to look down on everyone else. Elijah wasn't like that. Elisha wasn't like that. Elijah, Elisha wasn't intimidated. He said, let's do more. Let's go all out for God. Let's see what God can do. We need to be able to carry the mantle of the heroes of the faith. Because that's also what Elisha did. Elijah kind of was a trailblazer in a way for his time because people were so wicked and he felt like he was the only one. And he was the only one really publicly making any type of a stand. But what a shame that would have been if Elijah just, well, he was taken and there was no one left to pick up the torch, to take up the mantle, and to carry the, the cause forward. Now, was Elijah perfect? No, we saw some of his shortcomings. 
Was Elisha perfect? No. But they were still able to do a lot for God. We need to be able to, to carry that mantle of the heroes of the faith that went before us and be prepared to do greater works. There's a lot of people that, that dedicate their lives to serving the Lord that went before, before us. And we should look at what they did and say, yeah, I want to do more. Jump down to verse 14. The Bible says, And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him. Now this is where I have a problem with the... the the sons of the prophets, right? And we read about the sons of the prophets quite a bit in, uh, in this section of the Bible in general, but um, they see that, that he has the, the power of God on him, right? He has the mantle. He says the, they see the, the river parted, parted, right? Now, they're already kind of like, it's like, what was the point of them saying, hey, you know, your master's going to be taken from you earlier in the, in the chapter? It's like they're just trying to discourage him. So you got this, these, these, all of these prophets in their little group, right? And these are the types of people that I look at as probably comparing themselves among each other and, and, and see how good they are. And then they see people doing like a lot for God. And then they just want to just kind of, oh, Elisha, who do you think you are? Oh, don't you know that your master will be taken from you this day? He's like, yeah, I know it. Hold your peace. Be quiet. Shut up. And none of the other sons of the prophets were following Elijah. And none of them got the blessing. Elisha did. Now he comes back and they say, wow. It says, uh, they bowed themselves to the ground before him. So now they're showing him reverence. But look at verse 16. It says, and they said unto him, behold now, there be with thy servants 50 strong men. Let them go, we pray thee, and seek thy master, lest peradventure the spirit of the Lord hath taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send. And when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men and they sought three days but found him not. So now they're just, they're just pushing him like, look, he's got the spirit of God upon him. He's got the spirit of Elijah upon him. And you just say to him, hey, maybe we should go send him. He said, no, we shouldn't send. But they don't care what he says. They're like, no, we should do it anyways. You know, it's like, like he doesn't know what he's talking about. They were the ones already saying that don't you know that he's going to be taken from you? And now it's like, where's their faith? Like they, they said it before he was taken from them. Elisha now has the power, but now it's like they still want to just go out and find Elijah. And he's like, no. He's not out there. And, it, and this is just kind of this attitude, this mindset of these other prophets, these sons of the prophets, that like, they just don't want to listen. They already have it in their head, and they can't be taught. They can't be the servant like Elisha was, which is why they're never going to be great leaders. Which is why you never read about these sons of the prophets really going off and doing anything, any of their names in particular. Are they doing some things? Yeah, probably. They're probably serving the Lord in, in their own little way, but they're not doing anything really that great like Elisha and Elijah did. It says in verse 18, And when they came again to him, for he tarried at Jericho, he said unto them, Did I not say unto you, Go not? He's saying, Didn't I tell you this already? It reminds me of, of the way children act, right? You tell your child, don't do that. Oh, no, I really want to do this. No, don't do it. It's not smart. Oh, no, I really want to do this. Or, you know, come on, please just let me do it. Oh, let me do it. Oh, I don't, you shouldn't do it. It's not a good idea. Please let me do it. Fine, go ahead and do it. And then they go off and get hurt or whatever, and they come back. I told you not to do it. <laughs> what were you thinking? You know, it's just, it's, this, it's this not being able to be receptive to wisdom, to just receive it. All right, let's, we're almost done here. I, actually, I'm, I'm doing a little bit better on time than I thought, we, than I thought would be. Verse 19, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not. Hush your mouth. But the water is not in the ground bare. Now, when it says the water is not, it means that it's like, it's no good. They have water, but it's no good. And the ground is barren. So he's saying, look, I mean, look at the situation. The city's played, like we're in a great place here, but the water's bad. Like there's water here, but it's no good for use. 
It's contaminated. And he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. And, he, and they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. And there's so many miracles that he's done in this short frame. Now, you know, Elisha's just, just really lightened things up, so to speak, right? I mean, he came, he parted the, the, the river, he, you know, crossed over, and now he's healing the waters. They came to him with the problems, and he starts to heal. And then in verse number 23, it says, And he went up from thence unto Bethel, and as he was going by, up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head. Go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood and tear forty and two children of them. And he went from thence to Mount Carmel and from thence he returned to Samaria. Now this is also an interesting story. It's one of those things that's just kind of, sometimes it might get you scratching your head in the Bible. Like, why is this in the Bible? It's kind of a strange story. But we see here the blessing and cursing of Elisha and the power they had with God. And just as we saw with Elijah calling down fire out of heaven, God gave him the power to do that. Well, when Elisha was cursing his children, that, you know, God gave him the power to do that too and, and that God caused the, the bears to come out and, and the cursing was, was given forth. And there's a lot of things to, that we should be learning from this and looking at this. And you know, one thing, it says that 42 of them died. I don't think that was all of them. This is, a lar this is like a mob of kids. Now you could say, oh, they're just kids, but we don't know exactly how old they were. A mob of kids, even just kids, can be intimidating when it's just you and there's a whole mob of kids. And look at them, they're, they're mocking Elijah. They're showing no reverence, no respect under their elders. They don't care that he's a man of God. They're out there mocking, ridiculing, and, and you know, bringing him down, really. I mean, just making fun of him. And parents... You need to make sure you're, one, you're teaching your children right, teaching them respect, not to be these bullies, not to be out there, you know, shaming people like that, a man of God nonetheless, you know. Someone going out and, and doing good and healing waters, going out there and just making fun of them the way they look. You ought not to be just making fun of people by the way they look anyways, if God made you. It's not, a, it's not Elisha's fault that he was bald, that he was a bald head. We don't need to be making fun of people like that. And as a result, you know, look at what happened. The kids ended up dying. And children, you ought to be paying attention to this. You start running around with the wrong group of people, people that just want to cause trouble and, and call people names and, and get into all kinds of trouble and mischief and, and not do anything good and not be respectful to people. You start hanging around with that group the curse might come upon you. You hang around with the wrong people in the wrong places. It's easy to get caught up into what other people are doing. You need to learn to be strong and to not be a part of that. If you were in that group of kids that want to just start making fun of Elisha, the man of God, you ought, to, you ought to pray you have enough strength and boldness to be able to stand up and say, that's not right. You ought to respect him and not be a part of that group and not be hanging around with kids like that that do those types of things. Unfortunately, what happens too many times, especially with kids, is that even kids that, that, that were taught one way, when they're around a group of people, they don't want to be looked on as different and will do what everyone else is doing, even when it's wrong. And you, sometimes you can make a bad mistake like that, and it can cost you your life, hanging around with the wrong people. So pay attention to that. Take heed to this story. Parents need to be raising their children right, watching their children, know what your children are up to, know what they're doing. Don't let them just running around in the streets and causing all kinds of problems and, and being disrespectful to people. We need to raise them to be right, raise them to be godly, raise them not to be bullies, and raise them not to follow the crowd of fools. Because it's just going to lead them to destruction. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great stories here, even in this one chapter, dear Lord. It's hard to even touch on so many of the concepts that you have here for us to learn. Lord, I pray that you please help us to be diligent in our Bible studies and um, 
just accepting what the Bible says instead of trying to, to change what your word says because of something we've heard from someone else or, or something just we don't, we don't have an understanding of, of, of one or two verses, dear Lord. Help us to have a, a proper understanding, dear Lord. And when we're wrong about something and we hear someone explain it, that's, that's true and that's right. That's just, just simply from your word. Help us to be able to accept it and not to, to be stubborn and stiff-necked into some old belief that we've had because we were taught from someone else. But help us to always be sensitive to hearing your words and to receiving it um, as the truth, dear Lord, and not, and not to rely on, on any other man's wisdom, but on the wisdom found in your word, dear Lord. I pray that you please just bless our church, bless everyone here today, and help us to have good doctrine and good faith, dear Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.